Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Chicago. How are we all doing this morning? Uh, my name is Paul Kautza. I'm the Director of Education for the Data Warehousing Institute. I'm the guy that's responsible for all the classes and instructors and folks that you have in. So uh, throughout the week, I'll be around. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, give me any, uh, any insights of things you'd like to see, things you'd like to do. Uh, but this week is not just about the classes you're going to be sitting in. How many of you, is this your first, the first TDWI event? How many of you are veterans? Okay, keep your hands up. See those guys? Seek them out. Figure out what you should be doing this week because, and, and start talking to each other. This is a wonderful networking opportunity. I can guarantee you that somebody in this room has solved the problem you're trying to solve or has done the things you're trying to do or is working on the same pieces you're trying to work on. There's a lot of networking opportunities here. We'll have them at the exhibit halls. We'll have them at other areas. Uh, please take the time to uh, get to know each other. Introduce yourselves at the table because you're going to find people that can work with you and you can ha that can help you. So don't lose the networking opportunities here. Uh, the only announcement I have is that uh, tomorrow morning classes start at 8 a.m. So you'll have uh, uh, breakfast starting at 7.30. Uh, class is starting sharply at 8. We have a lot of people walking in the second day at 9 o'clock, missing the first hour of class, wondering what's going on. So be here uh, bright and early tomorrow. And with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Ken Rudin. Ken is the Director of Analytics at Facebook, where he is focused on ensuring that analytics is the key strategic asset for Facebook. He's responsible for leveraging Facebook's massive analytics platform to generate high-impact insights that optimize both Facebook's user experience and Facebook's overall business. Prior to Facebook, Ken was VP of Analytics and Platforms, Platform Technologies at Zynga, helping Zynga to become known for excellence in analytics. In addition, he is also responsible for delivering key social communication and personalization technologies which, power, which powered Zynga's games and act as the foundation for one of the world's largest social gaming platforms. Previously, Ken was the founder and CEO of Lucid Era, a company that pioneered the creation of an on-demand analytics market. Before founding Lucidera, Ken was VP and general manager of Siebel CRM on demand of Siebel Systems, where he created and successfully launched Siebel's highly, ra highly rated hosted CRM solution. Ken has also held uh, positions of VP of marketing at Siebel Analytics, which is now Oracle Analytics, and senior VP of products at salesforce.com. Ken holds a bachelor's degree in computer science and electrical engineering from Harvard and a master's degree in business from Stanford University. So it's my pleasure to welcome Ken Rudin. Thanks, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Rudin, and I manage the analytics function at Facebook. Historically, the analytics function in companies has really been focused on being treated as a service. It's been within companies, they think of it as a service, but the role of the analyst is definitely changing and it's becoming more proactive in driving businesses. And I really think that big data is helping to accelerate this change by giving us as analysts more information to uncover and the ability to uncover and drive more value for companies. And as an example of this changing function, this changing role of analysts within companies, I can look at Facebook itself. A few years ago, if you looked at a core product team within Facebook, it was comprised of three different teams. There was the engineering group, there were product managers, and there were designers. But now if you look at what makes up a core team, for products within Facebook, there's four groups now. It's engineers, product managers, designers, and analysts. Analysts are now part of the heart of every product team. So with this new world and with these new roles, there's also a lot of new best practices in terms of how to use big data to really drive some results within companies. And that's what I wanted to talk with you about today. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about for big data is the technology behind big data. And the first thing I want to say about that is it's not about the new technologies. For me and for all of the things that people have done with big data, really what it's really about is the business needs themselves. And if I look at the types of things people are doing, both my personal experiences and for colleagues who are doing similar things, 
if I look at what we're doing, the types of new things, the types of business needs that big data is really good at addressing it tends to fall into three different buckets. The first one is in the area of we need to do deeper analysis. Historically, because we couldn't fit all the data in one system, we had multiple systems, one for finance, one for manufacturing, one for whatever else it may be. With that, that means we can't easily find correlations between all these different data sets. They're in different systems. It's possible to do that, but it's very hard. If you can put all that data into one system, then you have an ability to really look at how they interact with each other, and when A changes, is that correlated to changes in B? across all of your systems. So it allows you to do that. The other thing it allows you to do is, previously, because we couldn't store all the data in one system, there was just too much volume, we had to aggregate the data. We had to throw out a lot of the core facts and a lot of the lower level granularity and aggregate it. So we would work on averages. And a lot of times, you lose some really interesting signal when you start looking at averages. But we didn't have an option before. But now we do. Um, the second thing is it allows us to do different types of data processing. There are things that Relational has been very, very good at, but there are things now that we want to do, particularly at Facebook, we want to look at text analysis to understand sentiment and figure out where there are multiple posts from people that are really about the same topic. So we can aggregate that instead of showing it to you three different times, we can show it to you as one news story in your news feed. Um, or when we want to do optimization models where we want to figure out how to rank the things to show you based on the relevance of the friends and the strength of the relationship of your friends. Doing that in SQL is really complicated. Doing it in something like Hadoop is very straightforward. It's very flexible, allows us to do things like that, very difficult to do previously. And then the last thing is it allows us to be a lot more flexible. When you're working with traditional relational systems, you've got a schema that encompasses everything from your ETL tools all the way through your reporting tools and the database in the middle. So when you want to change something significant, you end up breaking the schema. And you've got to change it in all of those different places. So it's a, a fairly brittle kind of infrastructure. Well, the good thing about Hadoop is there is no real infrastructure like that. There is no schema. So you can make changes very, very quickly without worrying about breaking a whole bunch of different things. However, if I'm talking about the fact that it's not really about the new technology, big data is not really about new technology, what I want to focus on then is all right, that allows us to broaden our perspective and say we can use existing technologies. So one of the core underlying things I want to leave you with today, and I'm going to put this right up front here, is that big data is Hadoop and these new technologies that are Hadoop-like, and even some aren't Hadoop, but the new technologies plus traditional relational. And I had a professor once many years ago, Jim Collins, he's written a lot of books as well, and he uses this expression, the genius of and versus the tyranny of or. We can do far, far better with big data if we think about relational and these new technologies instead of relational or these new technologies. When I look at Hadoop, it is really, really good at letting me explore enormous amounts of data to find out what's in there, to find out are there metrics in here that I should be looking at. What traditional systems like relational are really good at are the traditional business questions that we all still ask and will ask. That's not going away just because new technologies are there. These are the fact and dimension type of examples of which of my customers in which regions are doing better versus worse compared to last year. Those are still optimal to do in relational systems. So given that it's an and and not an or, how do we start? Think of this as an extend scenario, not a replace scenario. A lot of people refer to big data systems as NoSQL. Think of the NO in NoSQL as not only SQL. I think that's a much better way of thinking about what you really want to do. So extend what you've got. Start with the relational. An example here is if I want to look at trends in photo uploads by region, by the type of device, meaning whether you're on your laptop versus an iPhone versus Android, and I want to see how that's trending over time across different releases of our products. Relational is still the best way of doing that. It's simple. I can get the answer back in well under a minute. If I were to do the same thing in Hadoop, it can often take over an hour. It's not optimized for those things. But if I want to then figure out where are the people using our, our systems really coming from? Not everyone puts in their locale or their geography. Not everyone enters what country they're from. But we really need to know how is usage trending in Brazil versus Mexico versus Canada. 
So we use all kinds of signal to figure out where users are most likely from. Trying to do that complicated algorithm in a relational system is very, very painful. Doing it in a Hadoop is very straightforward because of the flexibility it gives. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that most people are thinking of, well, we've got a relational system. How do we move to Hadoop? We've got to kind of replace that. That's old school. That's my father's technology. How do I do something new? And how do I get into this Hadoop world? And what's really interesting is coming from Facebook, we started in the Hadoop world. We are now bringing in relational to enhance that. So we're kind of going the other direction. We've been there, realized that using the wrong technology for certain types of questions can be very painful. Trying to figure out photo uploads in Hadoop is nowhere near as efficient as it is in relational. So we started at the end and we're working our way backwards, bringing in both, because you want to use the right technology for the right type of question. So given that it's, it's an and and not an or, again, how do we implement it? Well, one of the things that you want to do and that you can do with big data systems is put all of the data, as I mentioned, in one place. But one of the challenges that that will inevitably bring up is that you don't have the ability to really organize every different system in your company in one environment. How do you put structure on all of that. It was hard enough when they were individual systems only serving a smaller group. Now these are systems serving the entire company. You're trying to integrate all of it. How do you manage that? And there's two different approaches from my two most recent companies about how we've done that. And they both really come down to the same essential thing, which is manage chaos. Think about the core elements of your data that you must manage. And then don't worry about everything else. Let it just kind of be, let it evolve as it evolves. That's uncomfortable for a lot of us, particularly in an environment like a relational environment where you want to have nice structured schemas. But how do we do that? In Facebook, we have, uh, we've identified which tables of the hundreds of thousands of tables that have cropped up over time, which ones of those, and there's only on the order of several dozen, that we must manage very, very carefully. And we manage those centrally, carefully. For everything else, I don't even know who owns those tables. I could probably find out if I needed to, but it's not that important. So there we allow people to be very flexible. You can create whatever, whatever tables you want, but for the things that we need to have consistency on, like who the users are, that's a core table that's managed centrally. At Zynga, the way we did it is we had one schema. Zynga does all of it in relational, in fact. Zynga uh, doesn't have any Hadoop at all. Um, they have a structured schema for all of the core tables, and so how do you do something very, very flexible if you have to have a structured schema when all of it's relational? The, a full 50% of the database at Zynga is one table that is essentially uh, a flex table where it has generic columns for dates and numbers and text strings and hierarchical levels, and you can use it whatever way you want. You can put whatever row you want in it and put your ID tag at the end so you know that that was your row and we just have billions and billions of rows in there. Looking at it from the outside, I can't tell what each of those rows mean. I don't know what the semantics are, but the person who's got their ID tag at the end of it, they know what it means. So that's how we've done it within Zynga. So half of the database highly structured. The other half is essentially totally unstructured. It is implemented as a relational table, but the semantics of it are totally unstructured. That's really the only way to make it work, and it does work out quite well. And when do you use which one? When do you use Hadoop versus relational? If we look at it by three different slices, the type of analysis, what we tend to do at Facebook is we will use Hadoop to look through the data to find out what metrics are in there that I really care about. And once we've identified that, things like it's not the size of your social network, it's how many people within that social network you interact with on a weekly basis. That's an important metric that we can call your active social network. And that's correlated to all kinds of good things that we, we like to see happen, and it is correlated with engagement and so on. Then we'll use relational to start tracking all of the changes in that metric and figuring out what, it, what things drive changes in that metric. When we look at the granularity of the data, the, all of the data flows into our Hadoop system initially from all the different sources. And that's where we've got all the granular data. Again, that's what's required to do 
what I was talking about on the first row there, to figure out, look through all of the data, do data mining, do traditional querying to figure out what the metrics are, what's really relevant there. Then we'll, once we know what that is, then to make it a lot simpler to access, we can do aggregations along meaningful business dimensions so that when you go in, you don't have to deal with petabytes and petabytes of information. You can deal with gigabytes of information that you need to query through now to get the answers you're looking for. And in terms of time frames, when we do monitoring, uh, if we want to know when something happened within a few minutes of it happening, the data flows into our, our Hadoop system because it can handle all of that data. We'll do more of the monitoring and near real-time analysis in the Hadoop world, but if I want to do long-term trending over the last three years of some metric, there it's much faster and much easier for us to do that in our relational system. So that's how we've split it all up. So that's the technology part. But as I said, technology is only a part of it. So I want to focus on the business aspects of how you can really use not just big data, but any data in general to really drive results and become very much a data-driven company. So the, the, the thing you need to keep in mind is you have to think about analytics holistically. And there's a few elements. We, we've already talked about the infrastructure level. and. Uh, in too many conversations, that's kind of where it starts and ends, particularly when it comes to Hadoop, about what do you store in there, what do you not store in there, um, and where should we use it, and how do we implement it, and so on. And what are the speeds of, versus, of queries versus a traditional relational system. Too much time is spent on that one level. There are other levels. Of course, there are levels like focusing on the analysis itself. What types of analyses are we doing? And there's three categories of analysis that I'll walk through. And you want to make sure you're focusing on a good balance of all of them. But even that's not enough. There's two other elements which I think are, which complete the circle in terms of really thinking holistically about analytics. And that's the org structure and that's culture as well. And I'll touch on each of these. So let me start with analysis and talk a little bit about the different types of analysis that you want to focus on. The goal is not insight. I remember about 10 years ago, which was one of the last times I was an instructor at the Data Warehousing Institute, we were talking about it's not about reporting, it's about insight. And then we added one more word on top of that, which is it's actionable insight. You gotta make sure it's actionable. And I think uh, 10 years have passed now, and I don't really think that's true anymore. I don't think it's about insight. I think insight is necessary but not sufficient. It's really about impact. And this is about, again, the changing role of the analyst. Our role is not certainly to be reactive reporting, which was stage one, where somebody asks you a question, you give them the answer. Our role is not where I thought it was 10 years ago, which was uncovering insights about how to improve the business. Our role is really about driving impact. And, and I'll talk about what I mean there. But the big difference between uncovering insights and driving impact is there's a big difference between saying, Here's a way where I think we can increase the number of photo uploads per user versus, and ha having that as my goal to find ways to increase versus saying my goal really is to increase the number of photo uploads. So again, the difference is here's a way to do it. That's the middle circle there versus I'm going to make sure that it actually happens, which is the top circle. And that's really what we're focused on. So, what do I mean by impact, though? It's, it's a word that uh, anyone can define any way they want, so here's my attempt at that. For me, it really means one of three different things. How do you know you've had impact? And these are not unique. They often, uh, when you change one, you'll change more than one. But the first thing about impact is moving a metric. Figuring out a metric that is something important to the, the company and saying, we're gonna change that from 50% uh, of the people uploading photos per day on Facebook to 60% within six months. And our goal is to do that. Our goal is not to identify how to do it. Our goal is to actually make it happen. And as analysts, in many cases, a lot of people are thinking, but I don't really have the resources to do that and so on. And in many cases, you may be right, but that's still your goal. It's like being a sales rep saying, I can't force people to buy my product, so you can't hold me accountable for my quota. I made all the right presentations to this customer, but they still wouldn't buy. It's not my fault. Well, it's, it actually is your fault. Maybe you were talking to the wrong customers. Maybe you didn't really understand their needs. Maybe you weren't evangelizing the product the right way. 
We've got to do the same thing as analysts as well. We, I talk about analysts as evangelists. I talk about understanding the need so you're focusing on the right type of analysis in the first place. So the first one is moving a metric. And as it says under there, if you can read that, find a needle and then move it. The second part about having an impact with analytics is using it to change a product. So if a product was going to have one set of features, but because of analysis you've done, you've convinced them to change that to make it a little easier or a little faster or whatever it is, you've had an impact. And so that actually is a real product on the top, and there's a video of a guy riding it, and I, I don't know how you do that, but it does work. Um, but I would imagine it's quite hard to do. You can do analysis and come up with, here's a much easier version. Why don't we put another wheel on it? It makes it a lot easier to use. Doing analysis to figure out, this is a lot of where classic A-B testing comes in, figuring out what's the best thing to do with the product, and saying, it's because I was there that that happened. That's having an impact. A third part is changing a process or changing a behavior. And it can be both internal or external. Internally, for example, at Facebook, we now have a process by which products get released. We used to build products, we'd do QA, and then we'd put it out there and then quickly see what happens. Now, because of the way we've used analytics internally, we'll do tests on small groups of people. Then we will come back with, with uh, an internal dashboard that says, here are the impacts of these new sets of features across all kinds of metrics that we care about for the company in terms of how many people are using the product and their daily engagement with the product. Does it have any impact on revenue? Is it enabling or preventing more fraud? Whatever it may be, we will look at that across a series of one to two dozen metrics that we care about. So we've changed an internal process based on data. You can also go through and change user behaviors as well. And if that's changed because of analysis you've done, you've had an impact. So it almost always tends to fall in one or more of these buckets. Move a metric, change a product, change a process, or change a behavior. That's what I mean by making sure you have an impact. That's what you need to focus on. The way to do that is focusing on the impact cycle, which is the part on the right. But before you get there, I used to only talk about the part on the right. Before you get there, you have to do the part on the left, which is just table stakes. And if we were at the Vegas conference, I guess that would be an even more relevant comment. But it applies everywhere. Table stakes means that this is the stuff you have to get in as part of your culture. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And make sure that this is done. Um, a few years ago, we would launch products and then say, all right, let's do the analysis of how it's working. And we come back with answers like, well, I think we are getting more comments. But I'm not really sure because we're not exactly logging everything from mobile. We've got it on web, but mobile, we're doing a little bit of guessing here. So we've missed the table stakes there. So the whole impact cycle doesn't really work because there's too much guessing going on. Table stakes says, first, start with the goal. Why are we doing what we're doing? Making sure that everybody across the company has a goal. And as analysts in certain divisions within my own company, we have taken on the task initially of sitting down with the team saying, I know what you say you want to do, but let's figure out a measurable goal to figure out if we have, in fact, done that. So it's identifying the goal, figuring out what metrics you need, and then making sure you've got the logging in place, somehow capturing the data so that you can then get to this impact phase, which I'll go through each of these. But you start with an understand the layout of where you are, then go into probably the toughest part of this cycle, which is identify areas for improvement, and then going into the last part, which is execute, making sure people actually act on it, owning that part, not handing it off as a white paper or as a chart or a graph saying, here's what you should do, but actually being part of the process that makes it happen. So talking about the understand phase, this is really uh, it, it's trying to get the lay of the land, but really the, the most value that comes out of this phase is focusing on what are the right questions we should be asking. I used the example a little bit earlier about should we be asking about how many friends people have? Is that the right metric we should, should be looking at for engagement? Or you know what? What's even more highly correlated than that is the number of friends that they interact with on a weekly basis, meaning that they like something that they've done or they comment on it or they send a message to. That's what we really need to focus on. So getting answers, just trying to do a survey of what's going on, is not 
the, the most highly valued thing. And it's not even that hard anymore. There is so much technology out there to get answers that it's become the easier part of being an, 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 of being an analyst. And as I mentioned here, it sets you up to be reactive. If you think of yourself as I provide answers in a timely fashion, then you, you end up waiting a lot for people to ask you a question so you can show how good you are at answering it. What you really want to do is focus on defining what are the right questions up front. What are the metrics that matter? And what have I observed in terms of ways that I can move that metric? Then you get into the next part, which as I mentioned, this is, this is the hardest part usually for an analyst. Because this part involves some art as well as some science. And also, you're usually not alone in this. Uh, which makes it a little bit easier. You're usually working with people who may have more of an art bent than you have. Um, you're working as a team. You're trying to be yin and yang and trying not to rip each other's heads off in the process. It can be pretty tense. But you're trying to figure out, once I have the lay of the land, here's where we are. The next question is, how do I make that better? Current state of the art in analytics is there is no solution I'm aware of that will identify for you Here's ideas of how you can improve what you're doing. It's a combination of art and science. You have to have just the right amount of each. And it's a balance. And I talk about hippos and groundhogs, uh, not a thing you probably frequently discuss in your own businesses, but I talk about hippos and groundhogs a lot. Um, hippo is what happens when you have not enough science. You've got too much art, not enough science. You know you're in this hippo scenario when you've got somebody pounding on the table saying, we're going to do it my way. I've been here longer than you. I know better than you know. This is what always works. This is how we're going to do it. You don't have enough data to refute that. Either nobody ever set up logging for it or you haven't done your homework. So all you can do is say, all right, I'm going to go with your gut instinct. So the hippo is really the gut instinct model. And why do I call it hippo? Hippo stands for highest paid person's opinion. They're the person pounding their hand on the table. So it's the best I could come up with. Um, so that's the hippo scenario. The groundhog scenario. Have you guys ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Yes, right, it's a classic movie. If you haven't rented, it, it's probably, I don't know if they have it at the hotel here. Classic movie, Bill Murray, that's a scene from it. This is when you have too much science. The last one was too much art, not enough science. This one is too much science, not enough art. And as an analyst, that's kind of an odd thing for me to be talking about. About You have to be careful about overusing analytics. I think sometimes, uh, one of the, in retrospect, one of the issues we had at Zynga was we were using too much science and not enough art. We are trying to design games on spreadsheets sometimes. Not literally, but kind of figuratively. It sometimes felt like that. So in the movie Groundhog Day, Phil is the main character. He realizes that he's reliving the same day over and over and over again. Whenever he wakes up in the morning, it's exactly the same day as it was yesterday. And he gets to relive that same day. He's interested in this woman, Rita, and he decides he's going to try to woo her. He goes out on a date with her. It doesn't go really well. It goes quite poorly. He realizes, I've got another chance to do this day over again tomorrow. I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to find out what she really likes in a guy. What's her ideal guy? And I will become that guy. I will try and figure out what different things we can do. If we go ice skating, does that work better than if we go out for ice cream? If I take her to a jazz concert, does that do better than if I take her out for a nice dinner? Essentially, what this movie becomes, from my analyst perspective, is it's a series of A-B tests. All his dates are A-B tests. And he goes on and on and on. And no surprise, it doesn't really work. And why doesn't it really work? What he's actually done is he, he's tried to become the man she thinks is her ideal man. He's arrived at a local maximum, meaning he's come up with the best possible version of what is still ultimately a bad date. He never gets the breakthrough. He never figures out, in the first part of this, he never figures out, I need to do something different. I need to just get creative here. My A-B testing isn't working. So he realizes, maybe if I just try being myself, Let's see if that works. And that's his breakthrough. And of course, that does work. And she falls for him. So the moral of the story is science has its limits. A-B testing has its limits. It can get you to local maximum, but it won't help you get to that creative breakthrough. 
I guess the other moral of the story is be yourself in relationships, but I think a conference on big data is not really the place to talk about that. <laughs> Though I'm free for lunch. Um, that was phase two. It was the understand and the identify phase. The last part is the execute phase, which is critical. Don't stop at the identify phase of here's ways to do it. You've got to own this part. This, I think, is the most important, important part of the changing role of being an analyst. There are three E's that you should focus on in this phase. The first one is about evangelizing. Once you've come up with some insights from the identify phase, the prior phase, you've then got to go evangelize that to the rest of the product team or the rest of your organization that we should do this. You can't just send it out and say we should do this. That's not really evangelizing, that's emailing, which is also another E, but I don't, don't think it warrants being up here. So evangelizing is not emailing. Evangelizing is essentially more marketing and sales than anything else. And again, that can push us as analysts outside of our comfort zone. But if somebody asks me, as an analyst or as a leader of analysts, what classes should I put my analysts through? What do you think is the most important thing that they learn for continuing education? And I think they're expecting an answer like, you know, Bayesian statistics or whatever it may be. Learn some new product, learn something about, go to a, a class on Hadoop, something more technical. But my answer usually is send them to a presentation skills class, send them to presentation skills training. Because that's what enables this part. An analyst who is super, super strong, but uh, isn't able to convince anybody of the value of what they're doing, nor are they able to even understand which are the right questions to be asking in the first place, ends up coming up with brilliant answers to questions that no one ultimately cares about, which is a waste of time. Um, so you've got to figure, uh, part of evangelizing and making sure that your audience cares about what you're talking about in the first place. So you've got to understand what their needs are and what their opportunities are. Focus your analytics in the first place on things that you think they are likely to act on when you present it to them. So starting with the end in mind, which I think I stole from Stephen Covey or something, but starting with the end in mind, if you want to make sure people act on it, that will help drive what analysis you do in the first place. It's not about people asking you questions that you answer. It's about figuring out I've got to make something happen. I've got to have an impact. I've got to change a behavior. I've got to move a metric. What are the things that they are most likely to want to act on? So that's where the evangelize part comes in. The next part is experiment, where here the, the most modern incarnation of that is the um, A-B testing. And that's figuring out how do I uh, how do I figure out whether my great idea is actually great? That's how you most of the times get rid of the hippo by saying, all right, we're going to put out two different versions of this. And that doesn't apply to every company. I think being in kind of a consumer world, it's a great advantage that uh, uh, we have within companies like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn that you can make changes very quickly and come out with multiple versions and test that. But there's always some way to just test. You, maybe you can't do a perfectly statistically controlled A-B test. But even so, you can still figure out, I'll put out, you know, I just want to see how have we improved versus historical trends. And yes, it's, you, know, you can have all kinds of uh, confounding factors that can make that really difficult to understand. But still, you're experimenting, trying to find out what works and what doesn't. And it's the spirit of the experimentation versus the actual statistical significance of it that I think really makes, uh, really makes all the difference. And the spirit of it is that, I do not sit there and say, you know, should we do A or should we do B? How, what direction should we go in? And let's come up with a decision in this room. I think the spirit of it is, let's narrow it down to a small set of options and realize that the answer is, we don't know, but we can try it. Instead of saying, I know and I'm going to go this way, I think that works only for Steve Jobs. I don't think it works for many other people. So, you know, we mere mortals have to try different things and see what works. And then the last part is execute. Actually making sure, that's the last thing, actually making sure that you've 
gotten the team to do something. And then you can actually uh, you know, and evaluate the results at the end. So execute and evaluate and figure out, was my brilliant idea truly brilliant, or did it act absolutely do nothing valuable? So that's the execute phase. When I go to the next part, um, so, you know, that's the analysis part. When I talk about the next part here, which is the org structure, this is something that I think far too few people focus on. They will definitely focus on infrastructure, far too much of it. They will also focus on, we want to make sure we're doing the right analyses. I rarely see companies that focus on these two parts. And when I sat back and started thinking about it and talking to lots of people like you, the thing that kept coming up was our biggest issue is, it wasn't the products were too slow, because they're always too slow. The biggest issue was, well, I've got these issues with the org and org and org and culture and org and culture. So I want to make sure we talk about that too. And I try and bring that up explicitly in whatever company I'm in. And I encourage you to do the same. Um, where we were at Facebook a few years ago was a group of distributed analytic organizations. Basically, we didn't even really have an analytic organization. We had analysts, pools of analysts, little pods of analysts in different groups. So the problem with that, well, let me start with the advantage of that, was that we could move very, very quickly. You had a team of five or 10 people within one organization. They could just do whatever they needed to do. They had their own systems. They could do whatever they wanted. Yes, we did share a common Hadoop infrastructure, but it was kind of like silos of it. It was all physically in one place, but you know, the, the data didn't really interact with any of the other data. I think uh, it was the right way to start for a very small company, possibly, but it became apparent fairly quickly that it was costing us more than it was benefiting us. Just in terms of the notion that if you've got 12 different analytic organizations and you ask a question, like how many users do you have, you'll get 12 different answers. And it's not because there are mistakes. Sometimes it's because of that, but usually it's because in our own case, if I were to ask two different organizations, how many users used Facebook yesterday, I could get answers that differed by significant amounts because somebody was saying, oh, I'm talking about the number of people who actually physically logged in. And somebody else is saying, well, I'm including somebody who uses Spotify or somebody who uses Instagram and is posting information back to Facebook even though they were doing it through Instagram or through Spotify. But those are users, they're posting stuff, so you get definitional challenges. And then the company learns to not trust the data. And you get these people who are saying, look, I am analytical. It's not that I'm not good at data. Uh, I am analytical, but as a manager, I don't use data because I can't trust it. So the only thing I'm left with is to go by gut instinct. And I think that there are a lot more people who are much more savvy with data. People who you wouldn't think of today as a numbers guy or a numbers gal, but they actually are. It's just they don't have data that they trust. So what we did was, the next obvious step was, OK, let's consolidate all of that into one central organization, which is essentially the organization I'm running now. But that itself, physically centralized organization, has problems uh, almost on the same scale of being a totally distributed organization. It sets you up to be reactive, because you're now pulled out of the teams that you're trying to service, and it sets you up as being a service organization, you think of, I'm trying to service that team. They're coming to me, I need to provide service. And I think the second thing is it also makes you start to think of uh, analytics as kind of like a quality division, where you would never have a quality division in most companies. Every organization should be responsible for their own quality and managing that. You don't build the product and say, here, you guys, guys go tell me whether this car is high quality or not, but we engineers will have nothing to do with that. They need to be involved throughout. If you have a purely centralized analytics organization, you start to give people the feeling that we'll do whatever we do. I don't, we don't have to worry about analytics because there's a central group elsewhere that thinks about the numbers. So we don't have to anymore. In the same way you wouldn't want to have engineers saying, I don't ever have to think about quality because somebody else is doing that for me. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't really make sense here either. So a purely centralized organization has problems too. So decentralized doesn't work and centralized doesn't work. So you're kind of stuck, or are you? Um, 
And that's where I've seen a lot of organizations do this. It's what we're doing now, and I think it works really, really well, which is you have a centralized organization with embedded analysts. So you've got analysts, and you still have a couple that sit in a central room, but most of the analysts go back and they sit with their product teams. So if you look at where I sit right now, there's maybe you know, a dozen or so analysts who sit with me, but the vast, vast majority are elsewhere throughout the company sitting with their product teams. And there are a couple benefits of this. You really get the best of both worlds. First of all, from a centralized team, you get one version of the truth. I don't have to worry about all these you know, 12 different numbers coming in about how many users we have. You'll have one number. You'll have a well-defined definition of what we mean by a user, and everybody will be aligned with that. You get the efficiency benefits from that because you don't have three different teams working on the same problem at the same time, not realizing that they're doing that. Um, and now you have one more, you, you can have one place to do that, so it's centralized and you're not wasting resources on redundant efforts. You also get the ability to tackle much larger products. If you've got a dozen organizations with five people each, who is going to take on the challenge of restructuring the central data warehouse because we need to focus on the quality of the data right now? How, who's going to say, you know, I'll do that, I'll get the other 11 teams aligned. It's not really my job, but I'll take that on, I'll volunteer, no one's going to do that. As a central organization, it's very clear that the responsibility falls on the leader of that organization to make things like that happen, and they get done. They tend not to get done when it's decentralized. And another thing which I always uh, highlight is it provides a career path for analysts that you don't really get often if you're decentralized. If I'm working in a product team and I'm one of three analysts, where do I go? I roll up to the product managers and the GMs of that organization. As an analyst, am I going to get promoted to be a product manager? No, I'm kind of stuck. And that's why analysts often leave companies because they see no way to move up. With a centralized organization, they can rise up through the organization if that's what they want to do. But by keeping them embedded, meaning at least four days a week, they physically sit with their team. You get the alignment of what are the challenges we're facing? What are the opportunities that we have? They're sitting at all of the meetings about the product. As I said earlier, they're part of this core team of engineers and product managers and designers and analysts figuring out what's the next version of what we're going to do, what's it going to look like. And it gives you these opportunities to be proactive because you're in this meeting and an analyst can say, you know what, another area of this organization did some analysis that I think would be valuable here. Let's bring that in and take a look at it. So they're helping focus on what are the questions we should be asking instead of just acting as a service organization. So I urge you all to think about this type of model. It took us a few years to get here and a, a few fits and starts, and there are still challenges with this model, and I'll highlight probably the biggest remaining challenge is, so who really controls the time for this analyst? They roll up to me, so I should be able to say, this is what I need you to work on, but they're sitting with the GMs for the various product organizations who are saying, I need this person to work on something else. And what if that GM and I have a slightly different vision of what we should be doing with analytics and what that analyst should be doing, which we're two different people, we've got slightly different focuses in the, in the company, that's going to happen. So we still wrestle with that a little bit, but of the different experiments that we've tried in terms of organizing analysts, this is the one that's been the most effective. And then the last part that I want to talk about is culture. Which one of these companies would you rather work for? Um, should be pretty obvious here. Company A is, they've got the, the infrastructure, it's really fast, it's really flexible, the coolest tools, it's they spent a lot of money on it, it's really nice. Um, and of course, you know, they've got people in positions who know what they're doing, they've been doing it for a long time, um, and they're the ones helping make decisions. You're not putting people who don't really know what they're doing uh, in positions of authority where they don't have anything to back up uh, uh, their decisions. You've got people who've been doing this for a while. They really know what they're doing. That's really nice and clean. And in terms of how you measure these analysts, you have very clear goals that say things like 90% of all requests need to be answered within 48 hours. You'll get the answer within 48 hours. Everything is well structured, nicely aligned, it's a, uh, very ordered. Company B looks a little bit like a mess. Uh, you're running MySQL and only MySQL because it's free because you had no budget and you couldn't get any servers either so you got the servers that the development team said are 
too slow to run our product anymore, so you can have them. And you've got Excel, because everybody has Excel. Um, and in the meetings about where to go with a product, you've got product designers that are spending a lot of time saying, we need to do this, and you're, oh, you keep throwing numbers at me, and you don't understand what's really going to make this enjoyable. You have, you have no sense of what a product experience is like. And, you, and then you've got the analyst saying, but look at the numbers. It's going down. And you keep telling me it's just because people don't get it yet. Well, they're not going to get it. And it's fighting and fighting and fighting. And then the analysts are complaining because they're saying, you're telling me uh, I'm being measured on the impact I have on the organization. How do I know if usage went up, it was up if that was because of what I did or because it was Christmas and everybody decided to use their cell phones more and were really popular on cell phones? How do I know that's a mess too? So clearly, you would want to work for organization A. Well, no, obviously, I've set this up so that I would never want to work at a company like A, except for the first row. That's nice. Um, but other than that, B is a much, much better place to work. You want to have designers and analysts arguing. Because if they're not arguing, what that means is the analysts aren't there. It means the designers are designing the product without you. You want to have them there. You want to have that yin and yang tension. That's how you get to a good product. Um, and you want to be measured on impact. And yes, it can be hard to define exactly what your impact was. But we're supposed to be smart people. We're supposed to be able to figure out how to measure things that are hard to measure. And there's a book uh, called How to Measure Anything, which is really interesting and it kind of helps with things like this. It is hard, but it's the right thing to do. So company B is definitely the better place to work. How do you get there? Start with goals. You can't have a data-driven culture if you don't have measurable goals. So every team where you have analysts, if they are with an organization that doesn't have measurable goals, you should pull them out until that organization does have measurable goals, or see if you can have the analysts help them figure out what these goals are. And then the other part is logging the data. Most companies, unfortunately, uh, when you talk to the engineers who are building these products, if it's a software company, they will talk about, well, I build the product, and if I've got time, I will make sure to log everything I'm doing. And therefore, you don't get the data back that you need. But you have to create a culture from the engineering managers that data logging is like QA. You wouldn't say, I'm going to build the product, and if I've got time, we'll test it. Well, some companies do that. But you're not supposed to do that. Um, so tr I always say data logging is just like QA. The product's not done until it's tested. It's not done until there's logging. Your analysts should think like a product team. They shouldn't think like a service organization. They should think about what can we do that's innovative. We've got customers inside the company. What do they need from us that they aren't even asking for? What, how can we change their world for them? Be proactive. And the last part is train people, not just your analysts. We have an internal system within our company, which we launched last November, that we call Data Camp. It's a two-week immersive program for all all comers, anyone in the company, all analysts are required to go through it. But at this point, probably a third of the class is analysts. Two thirds are engineers or product managers or people in support or whatever it may be. Half of what you want to teach them is about the tools. The other half is the other areas we've been talking about, which is what's the mindset you need? What's the culture you need? Focus on asking the right questions, not just focus on figuring out how to get the answers. And I'd like to wrap up with the last thing what really defines a data-driven culture is when analysts own the outcome. They don't focus on just the insights. They focus on the outcome. Your job as an analyst is to move the needle. If you have not moved a needle, if you have not changed a product, if you haven't changed the processor behavior, you have had no impact. It's unfortunate, but it's true. If you did analysis and nothing changed because of it, then ask yourself, would it have been any different if I had not even been here? If nothing changed, then no, nothing would have been different if you had not been here. And then the conclusion is, if, if it would have been no different if I were not here, how can I say I added any value? You didn't. You've got to make sure that something changes. So start with understanding the needs of the organization and understanding the lay of the land, then focus on identifying ways to improve that, proactively identifying ways to improve that, and then evangelizing that so that people will actually execute that. And then evaluate the results and make sure 
that you are working with them through that process so that you can actually drive impact. The people who do this well are the people who are changing the role of the analyst. They're the people who are helping redefine the future of their, of, of their companies. And as an analyst, that's the most exciting place you can possibly be. Thank you very much.